Welcome back. Welcome back. I hope you all had some good conversations there. I always hate having to draw this back when you guys are having some brilliant conversations, but welcome, welcome back. Um, my name is Libby, and alongside my husband, Julian, I am one of the senior pastors here. And it's my absolute joy to share with you this morning. And we're going to be continuing our service, continuing our series um, on our Alive series. And this morning, we are looking at Surprised by Hope. Now, I, I don't know about you, but have you ever felt totally hopeless in a moment, but it suddenly changed at the last moment? Perhaps uh, you're at a football match supporting your team and all seems lost, but in that last minute, it's drawn back. A few people, a few people relate to that one. Or perhaps in a pub quiz, when you're doing, we were at a pub quiz the other day and we were doing really, really badly, but you have that moment of hope when you suddenly know the answer to a few questions, right? One of my... Uh, so for a long time, uh, I was a youth pastor, and me and my husband have done youth work for a long time, and, and we used to play a lot of Mario Kart. Are there any other Mario Kart fans in the room? Oh, there's a few of you, a few of you. I'm not particularly good at Mario Kart, and I usually don't stand a chance, but I can remember those moments on that odd occasion where I would be driving the cart, and there would be that moment where I'd get a special upgrade, they've probably got a better name than that, but a special upgrade that would make me go really fast, um, and there would suddenly be a hope that I could win. That glimmer of hope. Now, those examples are fairly trivial examples, right? And I, I'm sure we all have moments in our lives, perhaps more somber, more serious, where things feel totally lost and totally hopeless. This morning, we're going to be spending some time considering what it means to really have hope by following the journey of two people who were surprised by hope in perhaps one of their darkest of moments. So I'm going to pray for us um, before we get going. Father, we thank you so much that you are a God who gives us hope, that we have hope in you. I pray this morning you'd help us to pay attention to what you have to say to us. I pray that the words that come out of my mouth would be words that speak your life into people, that anything that I'm not meant to say, I'd skip over, and the things that are meant to be said this morning would come to light. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So when I was looking at the topic of hope, um, there were four kind of types of hope that I think I came across. And the first one was this sense of vague hope. I don't know if you've ever had this kind of vague hope, but that kind of hope when someone says to you, oh, I hope it doesn't rain today, or I hope the economy will recover, or I hope something will change. And it's that kind of bland hope that we're really, I hope, we are hoping for something, but it's pretty much out of your control. And that kind of hope is often used as more of a conversation filler than a meaningful conversation, right? Then perhaps there's optimistic hope. Sometimes you might meet someone with a generally optimistic outlook on life. Um, and depending on your own personality and disposition, you will either find these people an absolute joy to be around or an absolute nightmare. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's a few fingers being pointed in the room. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with being an optimist in any way, shape or form, as long as it doesn't cloud our judgment. Sometimes this optimistic hope can lead us um, to not have a realisation of what's actually going on in a situation. So there, there are two kind of general hopes, but there's, there's two other types of hopes that I think are more significant to us. The first of these is a resilient hope. It's a hope that acknowledges the situation, the brutal facts, but still maintains that hopeful expectation. Um, Barbara Fredrickson, who's a social psychologist, describes this hope as one that sustains you. It keeps you from collapsing into despair. It inspires you to plan for a better future. In this type of hope, there's a kind of focus on setting goals, on your own agency, your own ability to make decisions, and appreciation that there are multiple ways to achieve a goal. In her research, she goes on to suggest that that resilient hope expands our coping mechanisms and helps us to plan for the future. For example, it might be a cancer patient undergoing treatment, an athlete facing a really tough competition, or perhaps a single parent facing real financial hardship. All might find that this type of resilient hope helps them to overcome and get through the situations they're facing. This type of hope is seen by many people as perhaps the most healthy, most helpful type of hope. There's evidence to suggest that this resilient hope 
increases productivity, increases overall well-being, even life expectancy. It's a helpful kind of hope. But it still does have limitations, right? For example, one day we will all die. Sorry if that's a uh, spoiler alert for anyone. Um, <laughs> but there's very little we can do about that, right? Very, very little we can do about that. It's outside of our control. So even this idea of resilient hope that psychologists say is so important for our well-being has limitations. But yet, there's a fourth type of hope in which death is transformed from this hopeless end into an endless hope. In 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, it says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. This fourth type of hope is living hope. A hope defined by Jesus, the sure and certain confidence about the future, even when things are really hard. When we have living hope, we trust in Jesus to be the anchor of our soul, keeping us secure in the middle of all the storms of life. Living hope is a hope anchored in faith, grounded in the promise of eternal life through Jesus' resurrection. This morning, as we consider what it means to have living hope, we're going to go on a journey along the road to Emmaus with Cleopas and his companions. So if you have your Bibles, um, you'll find the passage in Luke 24, but the verses will also come up on the screen, so don't worry if you haven't. The events that we're about to read about occur shortly after the crucifixion of Jesus and his reported resurrection on the third day. All of his disciples are in the state of confusion, disbelief. Some of them are still in a place of mourning following Jesus' death. Despite those echoes of resurrection, those echoes of that story, that Jesus might have risen again. It would be fair to assume that the disciples were experiencing perhaps the darkest moment, the darkest time in their life. Everything they'd put their hope in, invested their lives in, left families to pursue, put their lives on the line for, suddenly seemed completely and utterly lost. So we're going to start reading from verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with one another about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked them, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened in these days? This is a story about Cleopas and a companion who remains nameless, unknown. I've heard it preached before and you might have also that about that this story is about Cleopas and his wife. And this is just a minor point and a slight aside, but one that I think is really important to highlight. Although the two companions are often thought to be Cleopas and his wife, I can find absolutely nothing in my research, the text or the original Greek, to suggest that the second person is female or his wife. The second unnamed person is referred to as a companion in some translations, um, but there's nothing to suggest the gender or the role of this second person. This is a common assumption from ancient art and conjecture from John John 19.25, which assumes that Cleopas is a misspelling of Cleopas. Therefore, it's suggested that the unnamed witness must be his wife. Now, for me, I think it's really important that we don't make assumptions um, when unpacking scripture, because if we do, we can come to conclusions that simply aren't there. We don't take this approach in any other, any other scripture, and conjecture can't possibly be our theology. And it's reasonable to suggest that this person could just be a different person. It's a minor point, but one that does irritate me a little bit, because Luke is such a pro-woman gospel that I think that um, he wouldn't miss a detail um, such as the, this person being his wife. I think it's more likely that Cleopas had told Luke the story, Luke wrote it down, Um, And Cleopas had mentioned that there was one other with him. But the encounter 
with Jesus seemed far more important than letting the gospel writer know who the other witness was. Interestingly, you do need two people to bear witness um, to something for it to be a valid account. So please do what you will with that. Um, but I, I didn't want to start this by making any assumptions that aren't in the text. So as we read the story and imagine for a few moments what it would be like to be one of these two people walking down the road to Emmaus, we realise that hope is quite slow to dawn on the witnesses. Imagine for a moment the city of Jerusalem in the wake of the crucifixion of Jesus. The air is heavy with the scent of sorrow, the streets echoing with sounds of mourning. The disciples, once filled with this fervent hope for a Messiah, who was to deliver them, who was to save them, now walk with heavy hearts, their dreams shattered by the events of the past few days. I can only imagine the questions, the doubts that must have been whirring in their heads. Among them, we meet these two figures, walking in silence, their steps heavy with the weight of disappointment. Cleopas and his companion are wrestling with the events they've witnessed, their minds clouded with doubt and uncertainty. Where was this triumphant Messiah that they had hoped for? How could their dreams, the things they'd put all of their hope in, have ended in such despair? In verse 17, we read that they're downcast and sorrowful. Their hope in Jesus is lost in his death. The one who they loved and followed, placed all their hope in, was gone. Their future would have been uncertain and fearful. Yet, as we walk alongside him and his companion on that dusty road to Emmaus, I can't help but perhaps see my own reflection sometimes in their journey. How often do we find ourselves grappling with doubt and despair in the face of life's challenges? How easily do we feel like our hopes are crumbling in the harsh light of reality? Perhaps you've been in a situation where everything suddenly changes. All the plans that you thought you had for the future completely dashed. Perhaps it was through being made redundant, a house move falling through, a relationship breaking down, a loved one passing away. In these utter moments and others, our hope can feel completely and utterly destroyed. The witnesses seem to have lost any sense of future hope. We thought he'd be the one, they said. Their loss of hope is so substantial that they're so engrossed in those confusing and disheartening moments that they stop in their tracks when Jesus asked them what they were discussing. Let's read on. They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things that have happened in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. They crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tombs early this morning but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they'd seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said but they did not see Jesus. As we continue on this dusty road of Cleopas and his companion, we see their despair laid absolutely bare in the retelling of the events to Jesus. I do find it a little bit ironic at this point that they're telling Jesus what has happened to him. Um, but the discovery of the empty tomb just that very morning, it hangs heavy in the air. They acknowledge the situation, a missing body from a sealed tomb. Yet their grief and the crushing weight of loss clouded their judgment. A moment that should echo of hope. They've been told that people have seen the risen Jesus. That should be a moment where perhaps they're inspired to hope. In their grief, it still feels hopeless. In that moment, they're ignoring that opportunity to see the hope. Imagining the scene, their voices are probably choked with emotion, recounting the events of the last few days. A crucifixion is a brutal thing and their dreams shattered in the wake of it. The hollowness, perhaps, that now replaces their fervent hope. They speak of Jesus as a powerful prophet, a leader they believed would liberate them, but their words are still laced with a sense of disappointment. The possibility of a risen Jesus simply hadn't entered their minds. It's a concept, 
a concept too fantastical, too unbelievable in the face of their crushing loss. Their grief acts like a thick, a thick fog, kind of, they, they can't see clearly through it. But it's important also to note that their hope isn't entirely distinguished. It's not absent, but it's just buried beneath those layers of grief. Their very act of speaking about Jesus, when they were recounting his teachings and his deeds, they reveal this lingering connection, that spark of hope that hadn't quite gone out. There's still a glimmer of hope in the midst of this. This is where I think we can find real solace even in perhaps our darkest moments of despair, that tiny ember of faith, that glimmer of hope can still remain. It might be obscured by pain and doubt, but it's there, waiting to be found back into life. As the story unfolds a little bit further, we'll see how Jesus, with his gentle wisdom, helps Cleopas and his companion rekindle that spark, transforming their grief and their darkest moment into a moment of glorious hope and excitement. But for now, they walk on, still in that sense of burden, their hope temporarily hidden. As we read on, he says to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said to them in all scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked to us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned to once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. See, as Jesus walks with Cleopas and his companion, this subtle shift begins. He doesn't scold them for their lack of faith, but he gently nudges their understanding. You know, Jesus is gentle with us. He nudges us. He doesn't condemn us. In verse 25, he does call them foolish, but I think this is not in a condemning way, but in in the way a teacher might guide a lost student. He reminds them that the path of the Messiah, as foretold in Scripture, involves suffering before reaching glory. Imagine the scene, being able to walk along that road with Jesus, weaving together that tapestry of scripture, revealing how the stories of the prophets all pointed to this very moment that these two people find themselves at the center of, the suffering and subsequent resurrection of the Messiah. With each verse, a seed of hope, is planted in the hearts of them both. It might not fully bloom yet, it might still be hidden under the surface, but a shift is occurring in this moment. Their downcast eyes begin to perhaps flicker with a spark of curiosity. Jesus connected their situation with scripture. It reminds me that when things are really difficult, that I need to be immersed in scripture, my situation needs to be connected with scripture, and Jesus helps us do that. God's word is so important. It's so important for our souls. Now, as they near their destination, Jesus accepts their invitation to stay with them. In their moment of despair, in the darkest place that they found themselves in, Jesus stayed with them, despite all their doubts. The breaking of bread, a simple act often shared by Jesus and his disciples, takes on a deeper meaning in this moment. It becomes a bridge between the past and the present, a symbol of fellowship and a reminder of that last supper that Jesus would have only have had a few days earlier. And through the breaking of bread, it, it foreshadows the thing that we will do as a community of Christians for future generations, as we will in a moment, for thousands of years. As Jesus takes the bread, blesses it and breaks it, something extraordinary happens. In that moment, their eyes are opened. It's not a physical opening, but a spiritual one. 
the, the scales fall from their eyes and suddenly they see Jesus, the person who was with them all along, the person that's been walking down that road for some time, they suddenly realize who he was. Surprised by the very one who is the ultimate hope, the ultimate living hope. But what a moment when it's revealed as when we discover Jesus for ourselves. Some people in this room might have moments where they suddenly encounter Jesus. But for others of us, sometimes when we look back on our lives, we see that we've been walking with Jesus for a long time before we realize who he is. He's with us and he's walking with us. What a surprise when we find the joy of knowing Jesus. The recognition for these two guys is a transformative moment. The despair that has shrouded them is replaced by a surge of hope, a joy so profound. They, they say, they describe the feeling as, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Their hearts that were once so heavy with doubt now burned with this newfound understanding. The revelation they experienced isn't just about physically recognizing Jesus, but about understanding that bigger picture, the fulfillment of prophecy, the triumph over death, the promise of eternal life. This hope, once buried beneath that grief, beneath that darkness they were experiencing, is now ignited within them. This journey with Cleopas and his companion on the road to Emmaus, I think offers us some really important lessons for our own lives. Like them, we all face moments of crushing disappointment, of despair, when our hope seems dashed. But the story reminds us that even in those darkest moments, that spark of hope can remain and Jesus never leaves us. He's with us through it all. Just as Jesus opened their eyes to the scriptures that foretold his suffering and the future glory, he offered them the incredible living hope of Jesus. We too can find hope in God's word. The Bible is filled with stories of individuals who overcome seemingly impossible situations through their faith. I'd encourage you to immerse yourself in the Bible, immerse yourself in his scripture, where you can find strength and guidance and the promise of a brighter future. And the Holy Spirit who's within us will continue to reveal those things to us. The story also emphasizes to me that we're never truly alone. Even in those moments when we feel lost and abandoned, when we feel like we are all on our own, Jesus walks beside us, just as he walked beside Cleopas and his companion. His presence, that source of unwavering love and support, can offer comfort and hope even in the midst of the darkest of moments. The breaking of bread is important for the two people. In that simple act, their eyes are opened and they finally recognize Jesus. It's not just about physical sight, but about that deeper understanding. When we truly recognize Jesus in our own lives, experiencing his love and grace, our hearts are set ablaze of that hope. The hope ignited in Cleopas and his companion is transformative. Their despair gives way to joy. Their doubt replaced with a newfound understanding. Now, the situation they found themselves in didn't particularly change. The disciples were still in a place where they could face persecution. They were in a dangerous situation. But Jesus with them changed everything for them. Their list living hope, which is anchored in faith and the promise of eternal life, alongside the Holy Spirit, empowers us to face whatever challenges life throws our way not because we can do it in our own strength, but because Jesus is with us. It empowers us to have courage, to navigate uncertainties and find meaning, even in suffering. It reminds us that death isn't the end, but the doorway to a glorious eternity with God. Perhaps you're feeling a bit lost and hopeless today. Maybe something's happened in your life where your dreams feel shattered or you're facing something that seems impossible. The story here, the story of Emmaus, the journey of that road, offers to us a beacon of light. Jesus is with us. Jesus is wanting to walk alongside us in the midst of all of those things. I'm going to pray for us and Julian's going to come up and lead us in a time of communion. Father, we thank you so much that you offer us hope, that you are the ultimate living hope. 
that you are bigger than every circumstance, but you also understand the immense pain that we might feel in the midst of those. We say, come Holy Spirit, have your way in this place today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.